chills. Number one. This last May, my high school had a lockdown. I was homesick at the time, so my knowledge of the events that happened that day come mostly from what I heard through administrators and classmates after the incident, and the text messages I received during it. The administrators haven't disclosed much about the situation, which is only making the rumors surrounding this worse. After months of trying to make sense of all this, I am just tired and confused. Maybe someone out there reading this can finally help me. I'll try to provide as much background information as I can in order for this to make sense. I had been texting my best friend Andrew all day while vegging out on my bed with Netflix playing in the background. He first texted me about the lockdown at 1127, which means he would have been in 4th hour Spanish class. Being that the seniors had just graduated, his class was quite small, only 6 students besides him in it. Below are the texts we sent to each other that day, starting at 1127. Him, dude, holy shit, Lindsay, reply Lindsay. Me, what? Him, the school just went into lockdown. Me, like a drill or what? Him, I think it's for real. The PA came on during class and said, students and administrators, please go into level three lockdown procedure. This is not a drill. Like everyone's in the corner. Me, wait, level three? Doesn't that mean someone's in the building? Shit man, I'm shaking. Now the school better not be messing with you all. Him. It's so quiet now. There isn't a sound in the entire building. This doesn't seem like they are faking us out. Me. I just told my mom she hasn't heard anything about it yet. Him. Wait. I can hear someone walking down the hallway. Probably the office people coming to let us out. Me. What if it isn't? Him. Seriously, stop, Lindsay, you asshole. Me. Sorry. You probably have nothing to worry about, though, man. Him. I can hear them going down the hallway, turning all the door handles. Me. Yeah, that's what they do during a drill. Make sure the teachers all lock them. Him. They are talking. Me. Yeah, then it's definitely administrators. Him. No, it doesn't make any sense. It's all gibberish. I don't think it's even in English. What the hell? Me. Drew, you guys are okay though, right? Your door is locked and lights off. Have they gone in any other classrooms? Andrew, hello. Him. My mom isn't answering. Someone next to me is crying. He's outside my classroom. Me. Don't make a sound, okay? Andrew. Did he leave? Hello. Andrew. Andrew, hello. Please text me back. Andrew. He never responded. From what I've been told, the school eventually came out of lockdown mode. When they went around to each classroom to check in, Andrew's classroom door was still locked. They called out to the people inside and received no response back. Firefighters eventually knocked the door down. When they got in, there was nobody inside. The whole classroom was empty. Officials have offered no explanation as to where they are or what happened. I guess most people in town eventually moved on, shifted their attention elsewhere. It seems as though no one even cares anymore, but I still do and I need answers. I need to find my best friend. Number 2. In Euclidean Geometry a parallelogram is a non-self-intersecting quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. During my freshman year of high school, I had third period geometry honors in a portable classroom, a rickety structure with aluminum siding that is the size of a single classroom but stands as its own building. Portables A to Z were lined up in two neat rows of 13 outside the main school building. These individual classrooms presented the unique dilemma that students inside them walked to each portable outside for long enough to get uncomfortably wet in the rain, but not long enough to spend precious time putting on a raincoat. I'm certain that most teenage girls would be worried about their outfits, but I was an exception. Despite the inconvenience, I enjoyed having class in a portable. It was quieter out there, and when it rained the drumming noise on the aluminum roof could easily soothe me to sleep. And if the wind blew just right on the metal stairs, a harmony would ring out through the classroom. The first day of school, my geometry teacher seemed completely normal, who had decorated the portable with poster-sized memes relevant to math and 50-cent craft shapes you'll find somewhere like Hobby Lobby. She gave us a little printed-off infographic about the year that included some class information and log-on codes for online programs like the online textbook. It seemed she doodled a bunch of shapes along the edges of the infograph while she was waiting for it to get copied. I assumed she was just bored. She wished us a great year and luck with the rest of our teachers before she left. The second day of school, Miss Hambly had us go around the room and say which shapes were our favorites. 
a real throwback to kindergarten, I answered a dodecagon because it was the most obscure thing I could think of. After everyone finished, she told us that her favorite shapes were parallelograms. The foam shapes on the wall, I noticed, were all parallelograms of some sort. Parallelograms are so easy. They have their own definition in their name, and they're a riddle. They're a puzzle that I'm always deciphering, and soon you'll be deciphering it too. This year we're going to learn a lot about parallelograms. Soon they'll become your favorite shape too, I promise. It was a promise. I wasn't convinced. The first odd thing I noticed about Miss Hambly was that she left all the windows and doors open in the portable, even with the air conditioning or heat running full blast. This wasn't a problem during the summer, because I had geometry in the early morning when it was still cool out. But once the fall crept along, the entire class began to get chilly. I get creeped out with the doors closed, she explained. We're all alone out here. You never know what could spring out at us in this room. Bring a jacket to my class from now if you want to stay warm. Rhomboids are quadrilaterals whose opposite sides are parallel and adjacent sides are unequal, and whose angles are not right angles. Rhomboids are the most common shape to be addressed as parallelograms, although rectangles and squares are also considered parallelograms. Our unit on parallelograms wasn't that far into the year. She started off the unit with a long speech on the significance of parallelograms, which I fell asleep during. I wish so badly now that I hadn't. There might have been information in her speech that could give me some sort of clue or reason as to why she did what she did. She assigned us a packet on parallelograms that night. The next morning, she walked into class frantically, as if something was wrong. Get out your homework, she said quickly. I tell you every single day to get out your homework and you never do it. You should know what to expect by now. We did, but three or four people hadn't done theirs, which sent Miss Hambly into a sort of rage. You're just trying to make me have a bad day, aren't you? Well, I'll tell you something. And that's you can't control my emotions. You can't, and nobody can. Only I can. So you can stop trying to make my day miserable. The lights in the dinghy portable caught her face, and she looked worn down, almost frail, and her hair was frizzy, as if it hadn't been washed in a few days. Fine, throw it away. Pretend like the homework was never assigned. This is a bad habit that you'll have to break. She opened up a PowerPoint and adjusted the projector so that it was on the board. She muttered under her breath, I'm trying, I'm trying so hard, but some days I just can't do this. I was driving home after winter color guard practice at about 8.45 or so, and as we turned to leave the school via the road that passes right by the portables, I saw Miss Hambly walking towards the staff parking lot at a fast pace, clutching a stack of papers to her chest. She looked up as her car passed, and when she saw me in the front seat, she gave a weak smile my way. Who's that, my mom asked. Miss Hambly, I answered. She teaches geometry. Is she nice? She's nice enough. A parallelogram with base B and height H can be divided into a trapezoid and a right triangle and rearranged into a rectangle. This means that the area of a parallelogram is the same as that of a rectangle with the same base and height. Our unit on parallelograms intensified the next day when Miss Hambly walked into class. She didn't say anything about the homework from the previous night and pulled up a picture of a parallelogram on the projector. It had some parallel and conjurant markings, but nothing else. Look at that, she said, motioning towards the parallelogram. It's just a shape to you, but don't you get it? There's always something more. What does it mean? There's got to be something more. Some days I can see something more. That's all I'm here for. That's the whole reason I do this. Because Euclid clearly saw something and I need to find it too. There's some other meaning to all of this. Don't you feel it? I could already hear the snickers around the class, but Miss Hambly was dead serious. Miss Hambly paced by my desk and I caught a whiff of her. She smelled awful, almost like she hadn't been showering. And she was looking increasingly frail by the day. Her skin was pale like chalk and her fingernails were torn off like she'd been chewing them off in agony. But the oddest thing I noticed was that she had drawn all over her arm. I could see what was poking out of the sleeve of her sweater. Tons of little tiny parallelograms all over her wrist. The sum of the distances from any interior point of a parallelogram to the sides is independent of the location of the point. This is an extension from Viviani's theorem. The converse also holds. If the sum of the distances from a point in the interior of a quadrilateral to the sides is independent of the location of the point, 
Then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Luckily, the day afterwards was Saturday, and we had our first snow day of the year on Monday. When we returned on Tuesday, the color had returned to Miss Hambly's skin. She no longer stunk, and the parallelograms had been scrubbed off of her wrist. Her hair was thick and luscious. She jumped right into a well-planned lesson on proofs of parallelograms, complete with a PowerPoint, and assigned a sensible amount of homework in the textbook. Somehow it was a relief, a weight lifted off my shoulders. Nobody in the class, even Miss Hambly herself, commented on her sudden turnaround in behavior, but she seemed detached and artificial, as if somehow it was merely a facade. I fell ill with a fever on Wednesday, and by Thursday it was clear I had strep throat. I was absent from school on Friday, Monday, and Tuesday as well. On Thursday, Matt, a good friend of mine, sent me a text. I have these saved in my phone. Maybe I'll upload them in the future. Hey, where you been? Can't get through math without you. Hambly going batshit again. I responded, really sick. You wouldn't want this, even if it meant missing geometry. What kind of batshit? Parallelograms again? Yeah. He texted me Monday. Hey, N, not messing around. Hambly's crazy. Worse than ever this time. What'd she do? Flipped out at me and started yelling about those damn parallelograms. I swear, she's like, always high. She smells really bad again, too. Of course it's you. Did you not do your homework again, dipshit? That's besides the point. STFU, you know this class is stupid. I, our friend, is getting a little freaked out over her too and pretty much nothing phases her. I started to worry a bit again. And so I convinced my mom that I was sick enough to stay home until lunch on Wednesday so I wouldn't have to deal with geometry. But Thursday was another deal altogether. When I walked into math class, the entire portable stank reeked in fact. Miss Hambly's hair was sticking out all over the place in a frizzy mess. Her eyes were wild and bloodshot, like she hadn't gotten any sleep recently. Even after the bell rang and all the students filed in, covered their noses and waited for class to start, Miss Hambly did nothing. She sat at her desk, muttering things to herself and shuffling papers, and every once in a while she'd stand up and walk around the classroom, much to the dismay of our sinuses, but then promptly sit back down and began to scribble things on pieces of paper. It was the oddest thing I'd ever seen. The rest of class didn't seem to care. I vowed that I would ask if she needed help. I sat terrified, rocking in my chair, working up the nerve to ask if she was alright, and if there was anything I could do. The bell rang, everyone else left, and I nervously crept over to her desk. Miss Hambly. Hmm. She looked up at me, but her eyes seemed accusing. Uh, I froze. I was, uh, I was absent. For a week. Well, a week and a day, but yeah. So when should I get the work? She paused for a long moment, staring me down suspiciously, and then told me, Come see me after school. I'll give it to you. I left the portable and the smell of fresh air hit my nose. It's amazing how wonderful nothing at all can smell when you compare it to something much worse. The sum of the squares of lengths of all four sides of a parallelogram equals the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two diagonals. That afternoon, I returned to Portable A to find Miss Hambly asleep at her desk. She was snoring loudly, and her body heaved with every breath in and out. There were papers scattered all over the table. As I dared to walk closer, I realized that they were covered in parallelograms. There were hundreds of them, thousands even, with words scribbled in the margins trying to prove something or another. I wish I could show you what they look like, but they are all either in police custody right now or destroyed. Some parallelograms had conjurant markings, others had angle measures, and the penmanship was nearly illegible. I couldn't make out a single word, but the writing seemed fiercely determined. The ink often bled out onto the page as if Miss Hambly had been pressing too hard as she wrote. Miss Hambly, I asked. As she looked up, her face struck me. It was weak and worn down. She had a large dot of blue ink on her forehead from falling asleep against the ballpoint pen. Her eyes were red, as if she'd been crying. I'm so glad you're here, she told me. I need your help. Of course, I said softly. What? You have to see something in all this, she told me. You have to understand that there's something more than just these numbers and these figures, please. She began to hand me paper after paper filled with her nonsensical diagrams and numbers. They came from everywhere, drawers in her desk, underneath the computer. She even rolled up her sleeves to show me the drawings on her wrists. I can't rest until I get it. I'm sorry, I said suddenly, standing up. I have to go. 
my my mom's waiting a lie and we both knew it please miss hambly begged i know that you can see it you're smart i knew it from the very first day you were the answer to this question i've been asking my entire life take these take them she began to shove the papers towards me can't you see it i know you can i'm almost there i'm so so close to figuring out the answer to all this i have to go i muttered and i ran out i full out sprinted away from portable a away from my school and up to the first place i knew she wouldn't find me the marching band practice field i sat on the lamppost where my instrument section used to gather for after practice sectionals and i cried because i was utterly and absolutely terrified that night miss hambly slashed her wrists in the shape of a parallelogram she bled to death on the floor of portable a the door was still wide open the janitor found her that night during his final trash run the school was closed for a week during investigations and then christmas break started rumors were all over the school but i didn't confirm or deny a single one of them because i knew that the parallelograms were between me and miss hambly and of course the police when we returned in january we had a new teacher who was much kinder to us she didn't like parallelograms as much and she closed the doors and windows to the portable which was newly replaced and so it had the best heating system of all 26. the weeks following miss hambly's death i became quite interested in parallelograms there is something about them that is quite mysterious to me they have so many properties and laws that it seems like the entirety of the world can be proved through them I found myself up late one night, seven library books on Euclid, spread across the table, trying to decipher what it all meant. Miss Hambly had meant when she said, I have the answer. As soon as I realized how distraught I'd become that night, I threw the books to the ground. I ripped two of them to shreds in anger. There is something I am missing, and there is something we are all missing, and I will not stop short of insanity trying to prove it. Number 3 recently i took a job at a small private high school in the administration the school is in a very isolated area in the woods far from my town which almost led me not to take the job but the pay they offered was very good for my first job out of college and i needed the money so i packed up and moved on my first day i was greeted by many people but one who stuck out was a short man in his 60s with glasses and white hair he introduced himself as the head of the history department he told me how glad he was for someone as energetic as me to take on the new job and that he knew I was going to do a great job. He said his name was Tom Bennett. However, something just seemed off about him that I just couldn't place. Over the next few months, I slowly adjusted to living life in the small town. Cell phone coverage was spotty, the grocery store had a limited selection, and there were very few people my age. Through that time, I ran into Tom a few times around the school usually in the halls of the school or he stopped by my office despite getting to know him more i still had some uneasy feeling about him which wasn't confirmed until today this is where it gets weird one role of my job is to run and manage our school's facebook and instagram pages every thursday we follow the popular trend of throwback thursday or hashtag tbt as many of the high schoolers call it what it means is that every thursday i will dig through the school's archives and find old pictures and post them Today I decided to find an old picture from a yearbook to post on the page and try and see if anyone could identify what year it was from. To do this I went through old yearbooks looking for the perfect photo. I grabbed a stack of yearbooks from the 60s from the archives and started looking through them. The second year I looked at was 1968 and I found the perfect photo of kids playing on the grass field. I scanned it and blew it up on the computer screen and posted it to the Facebook and Instagram pages. Having nothing on my schedule for about an hour, I decided to look through the yearbook. As I got to the teacher's page, I almost dropped the book on the ground. There, listed with all the teachers, was the name Tom Bennett and a picture of him. That was in 1968, and he hadn't aged a day since then. Not knowing what to do, I opened the current employee directory, but Tom Bennett was not listed. What should I do? Update, Friday, January 9th, 2015, 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. Hi again, sorry for the delay in getting back to you. I had a busy and eventful day. I got to work early today and searched through many yearbooks and found him pictured in all the yearbooks from 1964 to 1973, but not after that. I was given a lot to do including editing a promotional video for admissions, so I set researching Tom to the side until lunch. 
At lunch today, I was talking with one of the teachers and casually mentioned how I was looking in old yearbooks and saw a teacher named Tom Bennett and asked if she knew anything about him. From the look on her face, I could tell she did, but I was not prepared for what she said. She told me, you must have been looking at old school papers also. Tom was a teacher here for about 10 years working in history. He was a very good history teacher and all the students loved him. Anyways, one day he doesn't show up, then again the next, and again the next. The school was unable to get a hold of him. Fearing the worst due to his old age, they show up at his house with the police to find it completely a mess. Drawers are turned out, stuff is on the ground, but he is nowhere to be seen. He was never found again. The police investigated but found nothing. If you want, you can probably go to the police station and talk to them about it. So I'm heading there now and thought I would post to you guys here first. Number 4. I just experienced something that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I ask you only one thing, read this entire story. I understand that it is long but the only way you can understand what has happened to me is if you know what happened to me in high school. I met Sean on the first day of high school, freshman year. Sean had the locker next to mine, and I had just settled into my locker and slammed it shut when the force of me shutting my locker caused all of Sean's books to fall out of his locker shelf. I stopped and thought to myself, great, five minutes in and I've already done something wrong. But Sean just looked at his books, looked at me, and then said, man, look at how much space that gave me, as he pointed at his now empty shelf. I laughed and he introduced himself to me. We sat together at lunch that day and realized that we had a lot in common. He liked basketball, fishing, and WWE wrestling, which is pretty much exactly what I like too. We talked about these things during that lunch, and we sat next to each other the next day, and the next day after that, and pretty much every single day after that. We were best friends for most of high school, but things started to change junior year. It was at the beginning of fall, right around that time in September where the weather is extremely cold in the morning, but it feels like summer in the evening. Sean came to lunch that day and he was looking a bit down. My other friend Douglas told him he looked awful, being the sensitive person he is, and asked him why. Sean sighed and said that he was just going through a phase and was depressed about how life can't go on forever and that he was probably going to end up living his life in a cubicle. Douglas laughed thinking it was just a joke but I reassured him that that probably won't happen, but my reassurance didn't have any effect on him whatsoever. He continued to be depressed for over a week and I began to worry. I wanted the old Sean back, the one that I could crack jokes with or the one who didn't care when his books fell out of his locker. That weekend, Douglas had invited me to his cousin's party and I thought that maybe a party would get Sean to feel better so I told Douglas to invite him too. Sean initially declined but I talked him into it. The party was at Douglas's cousin's house, which was right outside of town. It was one of the wildest parties that I've ever been to. I instantly lost track of Sean and Douglas, but I just hung around with some other juniors I ran into. Eventually I found Sean and he was looking a lot happier than he was earlier that day. I was happy that I succeeded in my plan and I enjoyed the rest of the party. On Monday, Sean was in a great mood and was himself again. Douglas looked at him and said, You look a lot better. What happened over the weekend? Did you hook up with someone at the party? Sean replied, No, actually. I met a few guys at the party who were really great. They understood my depression and told me about a club I could join to get rid of it. A club? I asked as I ate my lunch. Yeah, he excitingly said. You'd love it. They know how to help you find inner peace and happiness. Sounds more like a self-help group, Douglas said, and we all laughed. On Tuesday, I was in calculus with Sean. Calculus is the only class I have with Sean, and we usually end up talking instead of learning anything. But there was a big test coming up, so I was trying to listen to everything our teacher was saying and taking as many notes as I possibly could. I was focusing on the board when Sean passed me a strip of paper. I opened it up, expecting a that's-what-she-said joke about something that the teacher had just said, but instead it was a bunch of random letters. N-I-Y-B-U-Q-H-Y-J-I-K-Y. I was confused and wondering what the letters meant, so I sent a note back to Sean asking him what the slip of paper was. He sent me back a note saying, it's a backwards message. Hold it up to a mirror and when it's dark, it will reveal a message. I wrote out the letters trying to flip them around, but they still only came up as gibberish. I sent Sean another note telling him that his note didn't work, but then he sent me back another note telling me that he had gotten it from his new club and that it only works when you use a mirror. I thought that the note was a prank, so I put it in my pocket and forgot about it. 
That night as I was doing my homework, I reached into my pocket to grab my phone, but instead I pulled out the note Sean had given to me. I looked at the random letters and thought I would try it out. I put the note to my bedroom mirror and nothing happened. The letters were still gibberish and had no meaning. I texted Sean telling him that his note doesn't work, but then he texted me back asking if I turned off the lights. I realized that this was one of the things he told me to do, but I didn't think that turning off the lights would do anything. When I turned off the lights and held the note to my mirror, I was astounded to find that there was a message on the paper, have a nice day. I stared at the note until my mind started to think of the tons of different ways that this type of messaging could be used. I texted Sean back right away and asked him how he did that. He told me that it wasn't him, but his counselor and that only his counselor knew how. My excitement sank as I realized that Sean didn't know how it worked, so I told him to ask his counselor next time he went to a meeting. A few days passed when Sean handed me another note in calculus, B-E-Q-W-A-L-T-Y-I-T-T-B-I-L-L. O-Y-Q-E-R-Z-S-P-D-A-B-I-G-H-J-K. I looked at it and was excited to go home and try out the message trick again. After calculus, I asked Sean if his counselor had told him how the trick worked. He said that his counselor couldn't tell him the trick just yet, but that he would learn soon. We could screw around with the teachers a ton and not get caught. That night, I took out the newest slip of paper. It was longer than the last, but after I examined the last note, I realized that the amount of random letters equaled the amount of letters that each word had in the message. So when the first message said N-I-Y, it had the same amount of letters as day. I turned off the lights and held the message to the mirror. Happiness is right around the corner. Man, the messages Sean's counselors wrote were weird, but the trick was just too awesome. I didn't care about what the message said, just how it said it. I started to try and think of ways that this trick could work, but no matter how hard I thought, I couldn't think of anything. I went to bed thinking about the message, happiness is just around the corner. The next day, Sean talked about how the club was beginning to talk about depression and that they were helping him get over his fear of death. He said that they told him to treat death not as an enemy, but rather as a friend. Death is what pushes us to accomplish a great life, he told Douglas and me. I couldn't help but think that this was a strange way to look at death, and that maybe it wasn't the best description of it, but it did have a point. As humans, we do strive to make our mark on the world, and death is kind of like our deadline. A few days later, Sean passed me another note. Sean still hadn't learned the secret, so I started to forget about it and moved on to other things. F-I-G-K-L-L-I-Y-A-S-D-E-X-O apostrophe Y-U. I saw the apostrophe and was a bit curious. Did punctuation carry over in the process, or did it just become another letter? For this reason, I decided I would try it at home to see if there was any rules to this message thing. I got home, turned off the lights, and held the slip to the mirror. It's a great day to die. I froze. I just looked at the note. I wasn't expecting this. I was expecting another happy, upbeat note about happiness, but instead I got this weird death crap that Sean was talking about. The note disturbed me, so I ripped it up and threw it away. When I saw Sean at lunch, I confronted him, asking him about the note. He said that it was just a new outlook on death and that I shouldn't be worried about it. When I told him that I wasn't convinced, he said, Look, if you're so worried, come to the next meeting, then you'll see it's not anything bad. I thought about this, and I accepted his offer. He said okay and then handed me another note. Z-I-X-N-C-O-I-T-S-M-Q-J-E-L I went home and looked at the note. I couldn't tell whether or not I should hold it up to the mirror. Did I really want to see this note? What if it's something disturbing like the last one? I took a deep breath and turned off the lights. I held the message up to the mirror. This could be you. What does that mean? I thought about it when all of a sudden, I noticed something that almost made me scream. It was my reflection. I was smiling, but it wasn't natural. It seemed kind of forced and robotic like something was making my reflection smile against its will. My reflection was still holding the note in its hands, even though I had already set my note down on the counter. Its body didn't move, but the head pivoted so my reflection's eyes would always be looking into mine. I slowly walked to the light switch and turned the lights on, which caused the image on my mirror to vanish. When I turned off the lights again, the image didn't return. I walked back into my room, sat on my bed, and thought about what had just happened. I thought that the message trick was cool, but what I had just saw was mentally disturbing. Now you may think that what just happened would have caused me to have second thoughts about going to the next club meeting, but it didn't. 
In fact, it made me want to go even more. I was worried about Sean and if this club was telling him that the only way to be happy is to die, then he might commit suicide. I didn't want to lose my best friend. And the notes all had to do with happiness and death. They started out with positive phrases about how you could achieve true happiness, but now they were all starting to become dark. If Sean keeps thinking that these messages are true, then he's in serious trouble. I didn't bring up what had happened that night with Sean, but I did keep asking when the next meeting was. He said I had to be patient and that he would talk to his counselor about it soon. On Friday, Sean told me that his counselor allowed him to bring me to tomorrow night's meeting, but first I had to read one last note. He handed me a slip of paper with random letters that made up four words. T-H-A-B-M-N-I-Q-U-V-B-X-A-O-P-I That night I took out the slip of paper. I looked at it and thought of the horrors it might bring. My fear became so great that I decided I couldn't do it, so I put it in my desk drawer. I didn't care about what Sean's counselor said, I was coming whether I read the note or not. Sean kept texting me about how excited he was that I was coming to tonight's meeting. On the other hand, I was dreading the moment the clock would strike 9 and it would be time for Sean to pick me up. I spent the day thinking about what I should do if the meeting took a turn for the worse. Sean's car appeared in my driveway right about at 9 and he began to drive to the edge of town. He didn't say anything when I first got into the car and the silence was driving me crazy. So I tried to start a conversation. Where's this meeting at? I asked. It's at a park right outside of town. Sean answered as though he was programmed to say that answer. A park, I asked, surprised. Yeah, Sean answered, like there was nothing wrong about what he just said. Is there a problem with that? No, I answered, trying not to sound suspicious. We reached the park in 15 minutes and Sean led me to the middle of a field. As he brought me into the field, I noticed that there wasn't a single person besides ourselves. Are we early? I asked him. Not exactly, Sean answered without turning around to look at me. We just have to wait here a little bit. We waited for a while as my mind rushed through thoughts. Why is no one here? Why is Sean acting strange? What is this club? Some sort of... That's when it hit me. Sh Sean? I asked reluctantly, fearing at what the answer may be. Is... Is this a cult? Took you long enough to figure out, Sean said bluntly. I stared at him for a long time, emotion flooding through my body, thoughts flooding my brain. I felt many things at once. It was like a wheel was spinning in my head and whatever emotion the wheel landed on, I would experience it. The wheel stopped on anger. Why would you join a cult? I said with a raised tone. Why did you lie to me and say it was a club? Essentially, a cult is just a club when you come down to it. Sean said like it was the most normal thing in the world to be in a cult. Next up, confusion. Why would you even want to join a cult? I asked with a new tone of voice. Why did you bring me here? Because you disobeyed us, Sean said with no emotion at all. I froze, just like when I saw my frozen figure in the mirror. The only part of my body that moved was the wheel in my head. It slowly spun as it clicked on each of the wheel's spokes. It began to slow down. Finally, the last emotion, fear. Sean, I asked in a quiet voice, where is everyone? Sean let out a sigh and then did something that I wouldn't have expected in years. He pushed me. I fell to the ground and as I was disorientated, he whistled. One by one, hooded figures jumped out of the trees surrounding us. They had all been hiding the entire time. My eyes grew wide and I tried to crawl away, but Sean grabbed me and held me to the ground. You see, he said, every member of this club is given an assignment. They must initiate the assigned person into the club or else their fellow members will kill them. The more assignments you complete, the closer you are to true happiness. You were my first assignment. I was extremely close to fully initiating you. But something you did last night threw the whole process off. The hooded figures had surrounded me. They held me down and put a rag in my mouth to make sure I couldn't scream for help. The whole initiation process centers around five notes. The first to reassure the target that what he is doing is completely innocent. The third distracts the target and increases the fear of dying inside of them. The fourth shows you the power of the club and just what they can do if you disobey us. The fifth seals the deal and fully initiates the target into the club and they usually don't know what happened until they get their first assignment. That's when I realized it. I've been the initiation process the entire time, but Sean hadn't succeeded because I didn't read the fifth note. But how did he know that? How does he know that I didn't read the fifth note? You may be wondering how we didn't know you read the fifth note, Sean said as if he knew exactly what I was thinking. 
The club always knows what its members are doing, but that's not what we're here to do. Alex, take it away. Sean stepped into the ring of hooded figures and put his own robe on as one of the members came out of the circle. The figure, Alex probably, reached into his robe and pulled out a rusty mirror. He took a slip of paper from his pocket and placed it on my chest. He started to raise the mirror in front of me as two members held my eyelids open. Right before I could see the note, I spat out the rag in my mouth and screamed. This startled the members and they all started to run away. They wanted to initiate me, but they didn't want to get caught at all. They tried to drag me away, but I escaped the grasp of the man who was holding me and I sprinted. I sprinted until my legs were so sore that they felt like a thousand needles were being pushed into them. I ran until I knew that I was far enough away to consider myself somewhat safe. I have to say that I didn't call the cops. There were over 20 people there, and if cops didn't catch all 20, then I would be in serious trouble. I thought about telling my mom, but I figured that she would instantly call the cops too, so I didn't. On Monday, I didn't know if I should go to school. Unfortunately, I couldn't think of any excuse to stay home that wouldn't make my mom suspicious, so I reluctantly got on the bus. To my surprise, Sean wasn't there. I went to lunch and only saw Douglas, good old Douglas, sitting at our table. It's been over 12 years since I graduated from that high school. I never saw Sean again after that Saturday night. I never called him, texted him, and he never contacted me. I forgot completely about the incident until a few nights ago. My wife was out with her friends for dinner, and my son was sleeping over at his friend's house. I was watching some hockey on TV when my power went out. It wasn't raining, so I figured that a fuse probably just broke. It's an old house. I grabbed a replacement fuse and a flashlight and descended into my basement. I walked into the room that had my fuse box in it. The box was right across from the door, so I closed the door behind me and walked to the box. I reached out and opened the door to where all the fuses would usually be, but instead I got a surprise. When I opened it, there was a rusty mirror blocking me from the fuses. I was surprised and looked at the mirror. On there was a message, I read it, and then dropped my flashlight. I turned around to look at my door and written on it with black marker were the letters T-H-A-B-M-N-I-Q-U-V-B-X-A-O-P-I. I just fell to my knees as the thoughts of my junior year began to flood back into my mind. Beneath the letters was a message that read, Your first assignment is Douglas. Initiate him or die. I just sat there as the wheel in my head began to spin. All the while, the phrase that rang through my head, Welcome to the club. Number 5. So I go to high school close to Raleigh, North Carolina. It's not a huge school compared to some others, but it certainly isn't small. I'm in my junior year and it's all been a pretty standard experience, I think. I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I don't have a girlfriend. Playing my cards just right, I tell myself when I'm sad. Anyway, some dude in my AP Calculus class mentioned that he's gotten into a pretty big game and when I asked him about it, being an avid video game player myself, he told me it was called King of Pain and it isn't a video game. His name is James, he's a senior, football player, ladies man, very different from me. But he's smart, super smart and never causes any drama. So I figured he's pretty trustworthy. He tells me that he just started playing King of Pain in the last week with a couple of the other guys from our school. Someone at a party introduced them to it and they've been hooked on it. I ask him what's it about. A king is chosen by divine right, he laughs, realizing the way that sounded. Game terms, of course, he adds. What does the king do? All the king does is see how long he can keep his throne. How does he do that? James' eyes lit up and then he once again laughed. He almost seemed embarrassed by the fact he was so into something that sounded this silly. He takes it, man. After saying this, James reached into his pocket and retrieved his phone. I waited politely as he scrolled through screens and found what he was looking for, a picture. He handed me the phone. What the hell? I was looking at a photo of a deep wound, a stab it looked like, on someone's forearm. He's doing pretty good so far. James took the phone back and smiled. I don't understand. That's the king? Is that real? Yes. Who is he? James grinned wider and rolled up his sleeve. The wound was still there, in the midst of the healing process. It did not appear to have been attended to. James, man, that's not okay. We're gonna need to tell someone. After hearing this, James grabbed my arm, his grips instantly shooting pain past my elbow. No, don't. His eyes met mine, unwavering. Dude, you're hurting me. I'll lose. I can't lose. James let go but kept his eyes on mine. 
don't make me lose. I was of course unsettled and decided that I would tell someone anyway, because not to do so would be idiotic. There was clearly some bizarre sort of hazing going on, and James could be in danger of harming himself further. I contacted the school's guidance counselor and told him everything I knew. He said he'd look into it. James wasn't at school for the rest of the week. I stared at his empty seat in calculus and hoped that he was okay. I checked social media, but he wasn't very prevalent on there, so I learned nothing. I asked around, but no one had heard from him. I got the impression some of the guys I was talking to were lying, though. It didn't matter anyway, because last Tuesday, we were all informed that James had killed himself. I didn't want to let anyone know how upset I was. They might think I was milking this guy's tragic passing for my own gain. I didn't know him that well at all, but I had just spoken to him just before he did it. I had seen something was wrong, and he told me not to tell anyone. He asked me not to make him lose. I skipped school Wednesday, feeling sick to my stomach about the whole thing. Our counselor never contacted me with any answers. I'm not sure anyone knew why he did it, except for the other players, who I didn't know the identities of. I'm posting here as a therapy of sorts, and because I need advice, I found a note in my locker on Friday. It was an invitation to play King of Pain. It read, Come and witness the crowning of a new king. Come and build the throne. Come and see what becomes of you. All pain is temporary. It was signed by someone named Devin Wright. I quickly made the connection to the phrasing divine right that James had used. The rest of the note was basic instructions. Use a pen to leave a single line on my locker door on Monday and they'd contact me again. I shouldn't. It would be the stupidest thing I've ever done, but I want justice for James. With just a little more info, maybe I can get the police to shut the whole thing down. Do you guys know anything about King of Pain? What should I do?